Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. This evening's talk to you uh, comes both from my background as a scientist uh, and a student of theology, which I've been all the way through my childhood and on through to the present. And I thought that when I was growing up, the, uh, the experience I was having, uh, both being encouraged to do my work with animals and plants and to do work in theology were natural companions. And it was only later I suppose when I got into college, that I found that those things weren't supposed to match. <laughs> and, uh, and so tonight what I'm doing uh, is building on that work, both from uh, my study of animals and plants and from my study of the whole area of environmental ethics, uh, including theological understandings of ethics. And I'm going to put that together for you in a way that I think will be very helpful. To begin, what I'd like to do to give you a feel for what I'm now doing, since uh, uh, I began on the deserts of uh, Southern California, um, and then moved to Wisconsin from Michigan, uh, is that I now work with wetland ecosystems. Here are some examples of them. I know you don't have much rain here in Santa Barbara, but there are some areas of the world where there is a lot of rain. And here's, uh, here are some of the systems I study. Uh, not these specifically, but, the, but this type. Here are juniper barrens in New Brunswick. Uh, here is a bog in Estonia, which has uh, peat and uh, peat moss, an aerial view of a uh, wetland ecosystem off the coast of Florida, and then a papyrus swamp uh, from Africa, which we see on the right here, uh, and an upland bog in Lesotho in Africa, a mangrove swamp in Australia. Um, My home, Ruth and my home, is in the state of Wisconsin here. And uh, in the southern part of the state is this spot I've colored green, which is Dane County. Lake Michigan is right here, and Chicago is about right there. And this county is enlarged here to show a string of lakes, uh, Mendota, Monona, uh, Wabisa, and Kagansa. And we live on the southern tip of Lake Wabisa. Here is that tip, and we live in this great wetland. So from being a, first a desert biologist, I have now become a wetlands scientist, working largely on this particular wetland uh, called Wabisa Wetlands. And uh, this is a view that we can get from our backyard. Lake Wabisa is way off in the distance here, one mile from our backyard. And this is looking down on our house. Uh, and this is the marsh on this side, and we're on a drumlin there in the marsh. This is a cross-section of, uh, of the marsh uh, with about two meters, about six feet of peat that has been laid down by the wetland plants. And then this is underlain by uh, lake sediments so that at the lake edge with Lake Wabisa, this depth is 95 feet. And one of the things that I do uh, as a wetland scientist, is to use the history uh, record that's uh, embedded in these peats in the form of pollen grains to work out the climates of the past. This marsh, uh, we know from the peats there, uh, was part of a spruce and fir forest for the first 2,000 years, some 12,000 years ago. 
And since that time, it has been Oak Savannah, uh, a prairie community that uh, supports the prairie grasses of the Midwest. <clears throat> My research has involved how this marsh uh, looked uh, 4,500 years before the present, uh, 1,500 years before the present here, 3,000 years before the present here, and 45 years before the present here, showing that it once was a bay in glacial Lake Wabisa. So the reason I bring this to your attention is so that you know that I've worked in the deserts and I've worked in the wetlands. And uh, I'm an ecologist uh, who uh, has as my passion uh, understanding how the world works. And uh, I've expressed this passion uh, in the context of two other things that I have uh, seriously dealt with in my life. And the top here, science, is the one I've just described. I, I work broadly in environmental science, but uh, also in those two areas of desert and wetland science. But in my experience of applying what I've known and what I do know, what, I, what I've learned, from my experience, it's been necessary to connect uh, my science with the term in the right-hand corner here, uh, the, tr the term labeled ethics. And I've also found uh, it necessary to link uh, my work in science and ethics with praxis. Uh, in explaining these, um, science deals with the question of how does the world work? How does a desert work? How does a wetland work? How does a mountain ecosystem work? How does the ocean work? That's the business of science. and. Uh, Oftentimes, in our universities and colleges, we have courses that are pretty much restrained, constrained, to this particular uh, question. How does the world work? Uh, the uh, left corner of our triad, which I showed you, uh, on ethics, has to deal with the question of what ought to be. It's interesting to me that uh, in my teaching of environmental science, that uh, if you would look at the table of contents of the textbook I use and other textbooks, that this textbook is peculiar in the sense that every topic in it has an underlying ethical principle, an underlying ethical concern. For example, um, the chapter or the section that has to do with pollution has an underlying ethic that uh, polluted streams ought not to be, polluted lakes ought not to be. Uh, the section in these texts uh, on deforestation uh, and on uh, soil erosion uh, have an underlying ethic that deforestation, which is this large-scale removal of forests from land, or uh, erosion, which is the term named, used to describe the loss of soil, those ought not to be. So environmental science, which is my field, is very much ethically driven. It's driven by our understanding not only of how the world works, but also our understanding of what human beings are doing to the world. What are we doing to the world as, as a whole uh, society uh, worldwide? Uh, we are uh, engaged in a process of land degradation, which takes the form of erosion, desertification, salinization, things that reduce the productivity of the land, diminish its biodiversity. Uh, 
we are engaged as a human species, as a society also, uh, in uh, habitat fragmentation and habitat loss, which is linked with the, the problem of uh, species extinctions. Uh, we are also engaged in processes that bring not only local pollution, but also global, global pollution. And what an ethical uh, stance is on these things is to ask the question, uh, ought this to be? And if the question is, no, this should not be, then we come to the next question, which is the third corner of our triad, then what must we do? And that's the business of praxis. Praxis is the word used not only to describe practice, but also the whole concept of what it means to engage in practice. So these together then uh, form the science ethics praxis triad. It's important for us uh, to, uh, to know, some of us know this very, very well, uh, some of us do not, but in 1967, there was a very uh, important paper published in the most prominent scientific journal in the United States, the journal called Science. It was written by Lynn White, Jr., a professor at the University of California and a, uh, a medieval historian. And the title of this is reflected in the title of my talk. The title of his paper was The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis. And what he did in this paper uh, which is incidentally the most widely reprinted paper ever published in the journal Science. What he did in this paper was to say that the, uh, the cause of the ecologic crisis was a verse in the Bible, uh, Genesis 1 verse 28, and its adherence by uh, Christians and Jews and, and Muslims. Uh, and this passage, as, as he described it, uh, was the reason that we uh, engage in ecological and environmental degradation. What is this passage? It's a passage that describes human beings as being given dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. It's sometimes referred to as the Dominion Passage. And I guess if you would look at this in the Hebrew language, and you wouldn't look at anything else, Lynn White certainly could have, uh, made, a, uh, could, could have made a good case here. However, uh, Elspeth Whitney, and many others have done similar analysis, but Elspeth Whitney, a uh, an historian who also is a medieval historian, uh, recently at Notre Dame University in a paper she presented, uh, demonstrated that the chronology of the occurrences of various environmental degradations and uh, the emergence of the use of this particular verse uh, were out of whack with each other. And she concluded, and she, this will be published in uh, a paper which she is producing, she concluded that we could not say that this verse was the reason for the transformation of human beings uh, from, an exploit, from, a, from a fairly passive uh, response to the environment to one which exploited it. There was a second thing that she brought to light, and this is brought to light directly by investigation of this book as well. And, and this book is the book called um, Be Fruitful and Multiply. It's a book by Jeremy Cohen, 
C-O-H-E-N, and it is a book whose content is, is entirely on Genesis 1.28. And what he shows is that historically this passage has been used uh, in the area of dealing with the question of fruitfulness and multiplication and not dominion. Um, so we have to look for to other places other than Genesis 1.28. But what Elspeth Whitney uh, has done is she's helped us lift the freight of Genesis 1.28. Uh, lifting the kind of blame that was given to biblical teaching and allow us to look a little bit farther. Now, before I proceed, I think it's important for us to realize that some people have used still this passage as an excuse for domination. Uh, I don't think there's much doubt about that. But these are people who are looking for excuses if they are not looking for excuses but are looking at the teaching of the scriptures, uh, they will be reading more than what that one passage. And so what I'd like to do uh, is to get past that first chapter in Genesis for the purpose of us looking at what other texts say um, that are dealing with the environment. In doing this, of course, we have to recognize that the texts are written in Hebrew. Uh, and the first one I'd like to look at with you is Genesis 2.15, uh, which is in just the next chapter, from which we get this word that's coming into prominence now. It's coming into prominence not only in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic communities, but it is becoming part and parcel of the broader language. The word is earthkeeping. Uh, it's being used by some industries. It's been, been being used in some textbooks. Uh, and its origin is this particular verse. And the verse goes something like this. Adam is asked by the creator to, and I'm going to use the Hebrew words, to abad the garden and to shemar it. I'm going to get to the abad word in, in just a, 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 little, a little later. The shemar word is the same word that is used in the blessing of Aaron. Now, what is, how is this translated? Adam, and incidentally, Adam, or Adam, uh, is a uh, very close relative of the word Adama. So what, and Adama is the earth, or the soil, or the humus. So Adam, which is not only the name of a person, but is the name of the whole human race, Adam of Adama, earthling of the earth, or human of the humus, is asked to abad the garden and to shamar it. The shamar word is to keep. If you look at the use of this word, keep, shamar, uh, you'll find it most prominently used and expressed in many services of, of uh, Jewish and Christian people uh, in the blessing of Aaron, the Lord bless you and keep you. Many of you have heard that blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. The keep word is, uh, or the shamar word, is a word which does not mean preservationist keeping. Uh, there is a Natsar word for that. Preservationist keeping would be to keep things in a kind of pickled state, like pickles in a jar, uh, or a zoological specimen uh, in a museum collection, injected perhaps, uh, and preserved very well. Or some of these mummy, mummified remains that I find, I haven't found them, but I'd love to find one, uh, buried in a bog. 
Because if you do do as I do, as a wetland ecologist, you, you run the risk of being kept very well. Uh, because if you make a mistake uh, in your bog explorations, uh, you can be submerged and you will be kept. But you will not be kept in the not sar sense, uh, or you not in the shamar sense. You will be kept in the not sar sense. What does shamar mean uh, in these uh, Jewish uh, texts? It means to keep with all dynamic integrity. Uh, what it means is to keep yourself physiologically, psychologically, keep in good relationship with members of the family, with the community, with the soil, with the birds, mammals, plants, uh, and with the whole of the biosphere. It's that dynamic keeping. It's very much like what I do in wetlands ecology when I keep a wetland. The worst way to keep a wetland is to decide what the water level should be and hold it there. The best way to keep a wetland is to allow that water to go up and down uh, during the year and from year to year because there are some plants, for example, that germinate only when the wetland is drawn, drawn, is drawn down totally. Then the seeds germinate and when the water comes up, those wetland plants grow in that wetland. In other words, to keep a wetland is not to preserve its water level, but it's to preserve the dynamic. Another example would be, how do you keep a long distance runner? Uh, by putting that runner in a, in a padded cell between races so that they might not get bruised. That's not the way, it's to put the runner through its paces. So the shamar word is, uh, is the keeping word, and the keeping is this dynamic keeping, not preservationist. So taking my desert iguana and putting it in the Palm Desert Zoo is not keeping it. The way to keep the desert iguana is to keep the desert. And, uh, and that's a rich uh, teaching of this particular passage. I will come back to that in what I think is an even fuller and more beautiful teaching in just a moment. So earth keeping is one of the very strong ethical principles that uh, has a biblical base. It, is, it also has a secular application, which we're beginning to see increasingly. The second principle that I'd like to call your attention to, and I'm going to look at three of them, and then I'm going to uh, capstone that with a kind of all-embracing principle. The second one is fruitfulness. Here, I'd like to bring you back to the year 1909 and to a predecessor of mine at the University of Wisconsin, Aldo Leopold. How many of you here have heard of Aldo Leopold? Would you raise your hand? Uh, that's, that's helpful. Aldo Leopold wrote uh, a very famous book called A Sand County Almanac. And the most significant thing that he did in this book was to write uh, the essay called uh, The Land Ethic. The Land Ethic is the first time that we have in recent writing a statement that the concept of ethics should not only be applied to people, but also be applied to the land. Uh, he's a kind of hero. Uh, in the development of an ethical ecology or an ethical environmental studies. And Arthur Godfrey, the person who used to be so prominent on the radio, would frequently read from Aldo Leopold, uh, not only because of the beauty and the appropriateness of the land ethic, but because of how Leopold dealt with that in many different ways. Well, in 1909, uh, Elder Leopold was a student at Yale University in, uh, in forestry. And he, at that time, was a member 
of a Bible study group. Um, Leopold uh, was not a professing believer uh, in, in the sense that he was a member of a church or a synagogue, but he was a very serious student of the scriptures. And the point that I'm getting to is that in 1924, he wrote a most important article in the Journal of Forestry called The Forestry of the Prophets. I think it's important <clears throat> in the context of Lynn White, uh, who writes in 1967, to know that in 1924, Elder Leopold, not, uh, not a believer, but a student of the scriptures, uh, when coming to the uh, prophets, described them as ecological people. He describes, for example, Ezekiel as a woodsman and artist. He describes uh, Isaiah as the Roosevelt of the Holy Land. He describes Job as the... Uh, um, I have to, I have to, what does he describe Job as? Uh, as the keeper, I'm not sure exactly how this works, but uh, the, the kind of the ecologist of Judah. Um, in other words, what he is describing is that these Hebrew prophets, which uh, we sometimes read about, were ecological, and much of what Leopold derives from his land ethic seems to come from the study of these prophets who did transfer an ethical approach to the land as well. And in this paper by Leopold, uh, the key thing he cites is the last uh, reference I have here, uh, Genesis 34, 18. I'm going to put my pointer uh, around it right here. Uh, how does this passage go? I know I was extremely excited when I found this myself, and I'm sure uh, Leopold was extremely excited as well. It goes like this. It's, uh, and it's done uh, in the context of uh, chiding the sheep uh, who uh, are not following the shepherd. And it goes like this. Is it not enough for you to drink the pure water? Must you also muddy the rest with your feet? And is it not enough for you to feed on the green pasture? Must you trample the rest with your feet? This is a teaching of fruitfulness. Uh, the concept of fruitfulness is that the biosphere, the creation, must be allowed to be fruitful. Uh, we may take of its fruits, like clean water, uh, or the fruit of a plant, but we may not destroy the capacity of the creation to produce fruit. That's what fruitfulness is. The other two verses here, uh, Genesis 1.22 and 1.28, and Genesis 6, Genesis 6 through 9 also speak to this. In Genesis 1.28, we come back to the statement or the verse that Lynn White quotes. This verse, Genesis 1.28, begins this way, be fruitful and multiply, and it's given to people. Genesis 1.22, interestingly, also begins this way, be fruitful and multiply, but then it says, and fill the skies and fill the seas. It clearly is a blessing of fruitfulness to the birds and to the fish. Genesis 6 through 9 is the story of Noah and the ark. <clears throat> this story uh, is something that I have been directly engaged in with the US Congress. 
uh, you might have even read about it. Because what happened uh, around 1995 was the Endangered Species Act was uh, up for renewal and it was in danger of being seriously undermined. And uh, so what I was asked to do uh, and helped in doing was to go to Washington, D.C. with a cougar, a mountain lion, from the Columbus Zoo. And uh, one morning I was on Fox television with this uh, cougar next to me, uh, describing how this cougar uh, was threatened with extinction. I was talking about the Florida, the Florida panthers, uh, and um, and this was out to the Congress people as they were getting ready to go into work, and then uh, we brought the cougar to Bruce Babbitt's office. And he was holding a press conference there. I spoke at that. But then at the Willard Hotel, there was a big press conference with me and the cougar. And I described the story of Noah and the ark. What is this story? Uh, I was quoted in that uh, presentation by the New York Times this way. The Endangered Species Act is our Noah's ark. Congress and special interests are trying to sink it. Uh, this Genesis 6 through 9 passage is the first recorded Endangered Species Act. Now you have to think about this because it's quite fun. Most of the questions that we're asking today about the value of endangered species are answered in this story. Stories are very, very important in human history. Some of you know that it even is true today that storytelling in Africa is the principal way that people come to an understanding of the world. It is the principal way. It's not to have a listing of the characteristics of endangered species or to work in detail on the various com components of the hydrologic cycle, it's to tell stories. This story has within it a great deal to teach us. For example, it tells us that preserving the lineages of the creatures is a very, very high priority. Individual creatures are less important than the, uh, than the preservation of the lineages the lineages being what we usually call the species. Uh, you just have to think that through. Another thing that this story does is it answers a very widely asked question today. And that question is, is it more important to save species or to save people? This story answers the question. And the answer is something like this. Well, it depends on what kind of people you are. Think about that. Uh, think about the story of Noah and the ark. Noah, faithful, is saved, but lots of other people perish. And uh, saving species is very important. What is this involved with? It's involved in the principle of fruitfulness. Um, and the third principle I would like to identify with you that uh, is biblical, and it is also much more broadly uh, used than just in the Bible, is the principle of the Sabbath. We may not think this is a very important principle today, but you, all, you only have to look at the way we structure our week to realize that, uh, that has, it has remained important. Uh, we generally take one day in seven to do something quite different. We might do too much that day. Uh, 
uh, compared to what a, a Jewish rabbi might do. Uh, but we do structure our week this way. I heard a story that during the French Revolution, in order to improve uh, human productivity, they implemented for a very short time a 10-day week, and the horses died. Uh, it looks like most of us creatures need rest. And, uh, but the Exodus 23 passage uh, doesn't deal with the Sabbath of the week. It deals with the Sabbath for the land. And the law goes like this. When you come to the land that I will show you, the land will keep a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath of solemn rest uh, to the Lord. And uh, in that year, you are not to utilize your land uh, as a productive resource, but the food generated by that land will be for the poor and for the, and for the wild animals. It's a Sabbath. It's a time of rest and rejuvenation. One of the principles that I know that uh, is important in ecology is, is this. We must not relentlessly press uh, the various uh, things we call resources uh, and expect to maintain them. Out of 13 major world fisheries, for example, right now, we have achieved commercial extinction in, in, in 11 of them. Commercial extinction is, means that we run down the species to such a low level of population that they no longer are commercially exploitable. Uh, that's why your cod on Friday nights is no longer coming from Cape Cod because it has been uh, impoverished as a fishery. We're now getting our cod dinners from the Grand Banks. And some of you here in Santa Barbara are not eating cod at all. Uh, but it's very important to think about where the fishes are that we're eating. Because we tend to press creation relentlessly, not giving its time for Sabbath rests. This is important and a very important principle. So what we're doing here is, remember the original triangle I had up. We're saying, OK, here's what we know about the world, science. Uh, but also, we have this corner uh, labeled ethics, what ought to be. And then over here, we have the question, then what must we do? In fisheries, for example, this would be my opinion, is we should so manner, manage our fisheries that they will be sustained rather than driven to a point of collapse. Does that require science? You bet it does. Because you have to know the age structure of the populations to know whether this fishery is going to collapse in another five years or 10 years. Because there are different cohorts of ages coming through and you can tell when they're going to collapse. Because there aren't enough young ones coming up into the mature age classes into the future. Uh, but what we still do is relentlessly press. And what our triad would say, that ought not to be. We should maintain our fisheries in such a way that they can be sustained rather than uh, impoverished to the point where they no longer are commercially viable fisheries. Now we're going to go back to Genesis 2.15. And this should be interesting to us because I'm going to uh, put forth here uh, several different translations of this from the Hebrew. This one is from the NIV, which you can see here, the New International Version. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Here it is from Darby's version. And Jehovah Elo Elohim took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to till it and to guard it. 
Here's one from the Revised Standard Version. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And here from the King James, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. You can see that keep, that Shamar word, has been translated take care, guard, keep, and keep. Uh, but that first word, which I identified as a bod, is work it, till it, till it, dress it. Here is Young's literal translation, L Y L T, the Jehovah God taketh the man and causeth him to rest in the Garden of Eden to serve it and to keep it. Here's the Shamar word, which we've already looked at, and now you see how it's transliterated, S-H-A-M-A-R. And here's the Abad word, also pronounced Avad, uh, and there's a little apostrophe before it as we transliterate it, A-B-A-D. And the Abad word is also found in the book of Joshua. Uh, some of you know this verse well. Choose ye this day whom you will abad, as for me and my house we will abad, abad Yahweh, or Jehovah, or the Lord God. <clears throat> in all cases in the Bible where abad is used, it's translated to serve, except when it relates to agriculture. And it's very important for us to ask what happens if you just translate that literally uh, as serve. Uh, a, a, the best way, I guess, to get at that would be to think of our coming to a great botanical garden in the world, such as the Kew Gardens, uh, which are the most famous uh, botanical gardens in the world in London, and uh, come up to the front gate uh, with our John Deere tractor or maybe our Arians rototiller, and we'd announce to the director we've come to till the garden. Think about that, because the botanical gardens uh, are not planted in rows. They have palm trees and grapevines and all sorts of uh, mountain flowers in the, in the alpine house. Uh, it would be totally inappropriate to come with these machines. Uh, however, if we think of more traditional gardens as we would use them, till and cultivate seem to be pretty good terms. But the basic meaning is to serve. And the big question is, how do you serve the garden? Or more broadly, how does one serve the environment? We'll get to that in just a moment. The Shamar word, as we've said, comes from number 6, 24. Last weekend, I was with some rabbis. Um, I was at a conference center in Connecticut, and uh, I was with uh, Rabbi Arthur Waskow, who is uh, fairly prominent for his environmental work. Uh, he and I and... Uh, and others discussed the idea of serve. This is what I proposed to them, and they declared this to be a midrash. Now what I'm doing for you is I'm giving you my own interpretation, so this is not coming from somewhere else. This is, this is what I think, uh, and it comes mainly because I was asked once to speak to the Garden Conservancy of Long Island on the, on the garden in biblical perspective. And so what I, what I did is I, I put up my computerized version of the Bible on the screen, and I discovered this word, abad, found out it meant serve, and then I connected with something I learned from Rabbi Philip Bentley and Professor David Ehrenfeld, who's at Rutgers, about Jewish thought, uh, rabbinical thought, 
which goes something like this. Turn it about, turn it about, turn it about, for everything you need to know is in it. This is a reference to a text. So unlike some Christian traditions where maybe you're trying to get from Genesis 1 through the end of the book of Revelation, reading in one year, if you're a Jewish rabbi, you might come up to Genesis 2.15 and sit there for a week or two and turn it about. What happens if you do that to this? Well, this is what happens for me, and see if it works for you. It's rather odd that we, as descendants of Adam, would be expected to serve the garden. What's obvious to us is not set. What's obvious to us is that the garden serves us. The garden serves us with food. The garden serves us with beauty, with uh, nice microclimates, shade, uh, and humidity. It serves us with fiber and medicines. Uh, it serves us by producing oxygen uh, in exchange for the CO2, which we breathe out, breathe out. It's always serving us, but the scriptures do not recognize that service directly. Instead, they say we serve the garden. So here's the idea. The idea is that the service that the garden gives us must be returned with service of our own. And the prefix that we could add to the word serve to describe that would be the prefix con, con, which is the Latin prefix that means with. It would be a with service. It would be a con service so that the service goes back and forth. It would be a conservancy or what this could be called is conservation. Conservation, in my view, is a very important subject, but in this biblical view, which is kind of my midrash on it, it, it takes on a, a richer perspective because it shows that we, in response to uh, the creation serving us, uh, also serve it. Maybe there'll be some questions about that uh, following the conclusion of my talk. In the praxis corner, uh, what can we do? What I'd like, what I'd like to do here is to uh, bring you uh, to my own town, the town of Dunn. This is live on the internet. Uh, I and Ruth, uh, live in a town just south of Madison, Wisconsin. And what we have done is we've taken our understanding of how the world works and the community, community consensus of what ought to be, and we have developed a land stewardship plan for our town. We began this work in 1973. Um, it was pretty well established by about 1978. And uh, by 1995, uh, it was very well established with very wide support, and we renewed, we, we, we received the Renew America Award uh, given by Renew America. And in the year 2000, we received this award again. Our symbol is a sandhill crane. When we came, to start this project, there were very few cranes in town. Now there are well over 100 of them in our marshes. Our marshes are being restored. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, our agricultural land is now being preserved. Let me show you uh, some maps of our town. We're located on this chain of lakes, which you saw before, and here's Wabisa, where uh, we live. And uh, the town is located here, and it's shown here as this yellow square. And this is Madison, just to the north.
Here is a map that shows uh, in color all the lands that we have so far protected. And we have done that by the establishment of, uh, of some reserves, but mainly by a program of purchased development rights. What we did was, as many people have done, is they've seen the best agricultural land uh, gobbled up by housing development, uh, where we have added house to house uh, until there was no agriculture left. And a consensus of our community was that ought not to be. We should keep some of our agricultural land. So what we did was we decided to raise our own taxes, to create a fund, and what we would do then with that fund is we would pay the farmers what they would have gotten to develop their land, and they get to keep their land also. And the way we did that was to uh, appraise the land for its current use as a farm and appraise it for development use, take the two prices, subtract one from the other, and write a check to the farmer for the difference. That's called a purchased development right. They no longer have the right to develop their land because they sold that right. And typically, uh, our farms will uh, produce about a quarter million dollars in development rights. Depends on the size of the farm. So what we did uh, is to, uh, see, I'm going to get back to this. Uh, This will just take just a moment. What we did here was to take our knowledge of the world, where our food comes from was a principal part, uh, and couple of that with our consensus of what ought to be, and we put into effect uh, that uh, land stewardship plan, and also the, the plan for purchasing of development rights. So this is one example of, of a community taking seriously the question, uh, how does the world work, what ought to be, and what must we do? I'd like to conclude by saying that if we only know how the world works, if we only know, for example, that we can get a great deal of power out of the atom and we do not constrain that by anything ethical, we will find ourselves often doing things like moving right from this knowledge to perhaps building an atomic bomb. If we know how something works and we go right to practice, we might do as some scientists recently did. Uh, they took firefly genes and put them into a tobacco plant and we now have a tobacco plant that glows in the dark. That was a clever thing to do but it was not at all constrained or guided by what ought to be. Like, I suppose it really would be cool to smoke a cigarette that would glow in the dark or something like that. But Ethics constrains us uh, from doing things like that. So if you use only the science corner, you can get into trouble. If you use only the ethics corner, let's say if you're really ethical but you don't know how the world works, you can also get into trouble. There is a senator who is from the Pacific Northwest region, now retired, who generally voted uh, everything just right in my book, very ethical. But one of the things that he did, because he believed that death was bad, is he supported legislation to clear out the dead wood from the forests. Uh, this dead standing wood and the wood laying down. Of course, to be marketed, but uh, believing 
that that would clean up the forests and make them neat, you know, like your mom always wanted you to do for you, with your room. <laughs> uh, but the understanding of the science here was not present because the forest soil is dependent upon that death. The forest soil is built by the dead trees of previous generations. That's where that soil comes from. And so if you just use ethics, you know, your idea of what ought to be, but do not constrain that or hold it in place by an understanding how the world works, you can do the wrong thing. And then finally, and this is quite funny because uh, I have two stories of where this actually happens. If you just stay with the activist corner or the praxis corner, you can also do peculiar things that will be damaging because they're not anchored by science or ethics. The one illustration is one of my students one day uh, came storming in the classroom after I had just started my lecture, uh, running right in front of me saying, I'm so anti, I'm so anti. And I said, you know, it was kind of an interruption. I said, what are you anti? And she says, give me any cause, I'll go for it. And, uh, and she sat down and I continued to lecture. We talked a little bit about that later. Uh, but she just wanted to do something. Uh, and it didn't matter if she knew anything about it at all. She was going to do it. The other example is from a colleague of mine who was co-chair with me of the Wisconsin Wetlands Association. And we were in, our, in a board meeting. This was in 1972. And uh, he and others were talking about what could we do uh, as a way to get everyone interested in our organization. And I said, well, why don't we take a field trip to a wetland, to a marsh, perhaps, maybe to our marsh. And he said, oh, he said, that would be a wonderful thing. Now, remember, he's co-chair of the Wisconsin Wetlands Association. And he said to me, I've never been to a wetland. <laughs> and I said, Mike, you're co-chair of this organization, and you've never been to a wetland. And he said, no, he says, I haven't, but I'd love to. And I said, well, why haven't you? I mean, why are you in this position? And he says, well, I know it's a good cause. And I said, you know, wetlands are mosquito-infested places, disease-ridden. Uh, they're awful. You can sink in them. You can get mired down. You can be bogged down. You could get swamped. And he said, no. He says, that's not the way it is. They're really good things. And I said, you know. You've been brainwashed by the right people, <laughs> but you've been brainwashed. He also was an activist, and what's very important is that our actions be constrained by what we know. So what have we done here together tonight? Uh, number one is we've seen, I think, that uh, if we study the world and we know how it works, um, that we also have to accompany the knowledge we gain from that with an ethical uh, understanding of things as well. I've shown how one of the sources of that ethical understanding can be biblical teaching. It comes out of a very long history of ecological experience uh, of a nation which uh, was an a people uh, which experienced a great deal of environmental degradation and actually addressed it through the prophets, Ezekiel, uh, the woodsman, uh, and Job, uh, the, uh, the ecologist, and Isaiah, the Roosevelt of the Holy Land, and so forth. Oh, Job. Job is the John Muir of Judah, I have found, found it. Um, and the other thing 
that we've done tonight is to say, if you know how the world works and you know what ought to be, but if you don't put it into practice, it's really very worthless. There is a beautiful teaching in the Bible in Ezekiel again. And uh, it, is, it goes something like this. You sing love songs with a beautiful voice. You hear my words, but you do not put them into practice. So what we need to do, I think, as we're confronting these various environmental degradations, which I've described, and as we also enjoy the beauty of the earth, which is all around us, what we must be convicted of doing is taking that knowledge that we have and that ethical foundation, whatever ethical foundation that is, and make sure that we don't simply keep it to ourselves, but we put that into practice. I'll conclude with a description of my entire talk uh, by a Mennonite pastor who lives in northern Michigan, and uh, I don't think he's ever been to seminary, because in the Mennonite tradition, they just pick a wise man and say, preach. And uh, so here's a man uncontaminated by all the things I know, uh, and all the things you could learn in seminary. And he says this, Cal, if you would just simplify this, we could get out there and begin to do the work on the woods. We could begin to do our work. And I said, well, Willard, how would you tell them? And he says, I would say it this way. We should so behave on earth that heaven will not be a shock to us. <laughs> Thank you. We'll have a time for questions and comments. Would you, you like to? <laughs> well, just to, uh, because the presentation is also being taped to uh, come to the microphone with uh, the question. Okay, there's a microphone right up here, so uh, we're going to turn up the house lights and uh, please come up and ask your question. Or maybe they're too shy and maybe we'd have to bring the microphone to them. Any questions? I can see people just about ready to get up. Here comes one. Thank you for, for coming out. Are you aware of any plans uh, to um, curb the uh, practice of putting poisonous chemicals into plant, plants and farming and into the soil? This is a, it's an extremely serious question uh, having to do with uh, any plans to curb putting poisons into plants and putting poisons into soil. The only major work that's being done on that is coming through the organic food culture, the health food culture. Uh, there are some farmers that are limiting their use of pesticides, but it seems to me that the only real response uh, are from farmers who have decided to abandon uh, the use of herbicides and pesticides altogether and go organic. Um, and. So I think if, if we want to be healthy and if we want to uh, support uh, that move, then we're going to have to uh, buy increasingly uh, things that are actually identified as organic. And we're also going to have to be very good stewards of that word organic because there are many people who will be trying to capture that word and convert it into meaning that it is only mildly treated with pesticides or something like that. So I think that's what we're up to. 
uh, there is too much money to be made on the sale of pesticides for us to expect that the pesticide manufacturers are going to reduce their advertising. And it will be up to us as human beings seeking health for ourselves and our children uh, to select very, very carefully the sources of our food and shift the market uh, to producers uh, that do not use these. Now, there is a very famous person from the University of California. He was at Berkeley by the name of Robert Vandenbosch. Uh, he wrote a book called The Pesticide Conspiracy. Um, he uh, was very prominent as an entomologist. He developed the uh, concept of integrated pest management, uh, IPM. IPM is a very appropriate use of all means in order to control pests. And I would suggest that if you're interested in developing further an understanding of this whole issue that you would read his book, The Pesticide Conspiracy. Integrated pest management can work. It might even use some pesticide at critical points where it's not going to damage the people who uh, eat the foods. However, most all aspects of integrated pest management uh, manage the whole ecology of a crop so that, um, that there are natural controls that are put into place. There's a rich literature here, and uh, uh, agriculturalists who might be here in, the, in our audience uh, can consult that literature and use it as a means of transformation into a sounder and more sustainable agriculture. This passage, uh, Genesis 128, uh, sounds like it can be the cause, historic cause of ecologic damage, but we've traveled to many countries that have probably never even seen the passage of, <laughs> of Genesis 128. Some of the most polluted cities we've been in have been in China and, and India and other places of that type. So we can't really blame the historic roots. So where are the where are the historic roots? I, mean, I see greed and I see ignorance. Uh, would you comment on how did we get to where we are today? Uh, and it's all over the world. It's not just the United States or Europe or anything. Yeah. Yeah, and I can add to this, uh, the, the Orthodox Church, uh, which is Eastern Christianity, has never gone through this transition that we've gone through. And uh, they uphold the scriptures just as Western Christians do. So, uh, but what is the cause? Uh, the way I see it is that we have adopted a new religion. Um, the best way, I guess, to get at it is to say, to tell you a story of how at one time at a large gathering with, uh, with friends that were Christian, that uh, one of the people I was conversing with said, well, you have to look out for number one. And uh, I was starting to agree with him because I knew for sure he meant God. Wouldn't you have thought that? Well, you have to look out for number one. I had never heard the expression before. You know, these expressions have to appear for the first time for all of us. And I thought, wow, what a devout person to say that you'll have to look out for number one. And two or three sentences in, I discovered he was talking about himself. Uh, we have developed, and it's, recent, it's a fairly recent development, we have developed what can be called the number one religion. And it has a little O 
rather than a capital O. And it used to be a capital O. Uh, now, what is this? How does this translate? I have a great biblical text. It's called, I wish I had a blackboard, 33 colon 6 T T A M. 33 6 TAM. Is that a familiar, uh, it, a familiar verse to you? It goes this way Seek ye first yourself, and the kingdom will be added unto you. <laughs> uh, and of course, if you take 33 6 TAM, and turn it around, it says Matthew, M-A-T-T, -T, abbreviation, 633, which is seek ye first the kingdom of God. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, early in last century, was invited to give a talk uh, to the Economics Association of one of the provinces of India. And when he went up to, to give this talk, of which I've got textual material that this is based on. When he came up, he said, I don't know why you have me talk to the Economics Association. I don't know the ABCs of economics. He said, and then he said this, and I think this is really a surprising thing for him to say. He says, the only economics I know is seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. He said that. Not a Christian person. And that's one thing that I believe that everyone can gain from Gandhi's example and from Leopold's example. Uh, these teachings that we have in this major book of Western civilization are teachings that can be tapped by a Hindu, uh, by uh, a secular scientist, because these, like many teachings, are the embodiments of wisdom of the ages. Uh, what seeking first the kingdom means is seek first a sustainable ecological system. I guess I should show you another illustration, and uh, we'll kind of move this quickly through as a review. If you were my students in class now, I guess we'd call this a review session. <laughs> uh, there we go. You can see all this stuff passing. There we go. Isn't that fun to look at these things again? Here it is. In the Septuagint, which is the early Greek translation of the Bible, it was prepared for the library at Alexandria probably about the year 350 BC. Um, there, is a, there is a translation uh, of, the, of what we call the Old Testament. And uh, one of the uh, passages that I think is very important for our study together and our reflection on is Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In the Septuagint, this is translated this way, the G is the Lord's and everything it contains. G is the root for our word geology. So this is the physical earth. Uh, and the oikomeni, which is usually translated world, and all the creatures that live in it. What is interesting is that in the Hebrew scriptures, there is already a word for what we now call the biosphere. The biosphere is that shell that envelops the earth, that contains all of the life of the earth. And that in Greek... Uh, translated by these Hebrew scholars, uh, comes out to be oikomeni. Oikomeni uh, is the word from which we get our word ecumenical. Uh, what is ecumenical in the biblical view 
is all creatures here below. Uh, that is the oikomeni. Um, so when we're talking about um, the wisdom of this book, uh, the Bible, these 66 books that comprise this one big book, uh, it's very, very helpful for us to plumb some of the deep wisdom here, which already tells us that people before the age of ecology had this uh, great ecological concept of the biosphere and everything li that lives in it. Uh, the thing that uh, made this a number one religion with a capital O is the belief here that the earth, G, is the Lord's and the oikumene and everything lives in it. All of it was God's. So looking out for number one was to look out for God. Uh, and what we've done in our day is we've made ourselves the ones we look after first and that's how we lose it. Uh, if you seek your own life, you lose it. Uh, if you seek the life of others, you find it. It's, it's one of these other biblical teachings that is uh, so rich and so meaningful and so true. If we give, if we serve, if we give, then we get. If we grasp and, and reach and grab, we don't get what we're after. Uh, that's one of the teachings of the scriptures. It's a deep-seated wisdom. Other questions? Comments? Um, another verse that I've heard that uh, people have kind of uh, talked about Christians abusing is the verse in Second Peter, or maybe Christians use, yeah. is like the earth's going to burn up, so why should we even care about it in the first place? Yeah. Could you kind of comment sure. on that? Yeah, sure. the passage is in Second Peter, uh, and it talks about the burning up of the elements. Uh, last night I was in a classroom in a science building, and on the wall was a table called the periodic table of the elements. And I looked at that table and I thought, yeah, maybe tonight we'll talk about how all these elements will be burned up. Uh, of course, the periodic table came about much after the scriptures, and this isn't what the scriptures are talking about, is the periodic table. What is this passage that's talking about the burning up of everything uh, in Second Peter. What it is, if you look at it in the Greek language, is it is all written in refiner's language. It's quite remarkable. Like, the earth will be destroyed can be, as it's translated sometimes, that phrase, can be written this way, uh, the earth will be found. Uh, that's a better translation of the Greek word. It comes from refining. And if you have an ore, like iron ore, or an ore that's containing some other material, what's done in the refining process is it's heated up, and uh, the dross, which is the floating stuff on the top, is put off to the side so that you can find the metal. And um, what you'll find also there is a reference to the new heaven and the new earth. And the new word is a very, very interesting word. There is a Greek word for new, which is neo or neos. Neo means absolutely new. Um, uh, but the word is not neo. The word used in the Greek is kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S would it be its transliteration, which means new in quality. 
And that's refined. So, and of course, once you get a sense of that, uh, one of the things that reverberates in your, in your mind is Handel's Messiah. He is like a refiner's fire. And you, you, you connect quickly with Jesus' teachings about the wheat, wheat and the chaff. You know, you separate the, the kernel from the chaff, and the chaff you blow away. Um, so the scriptures there are not saying things are going to be destroyed. They say they are going to be found. It's interesting, too, in this passage in 2 Peter, it starts off by saying, when, as, it, it goes this way, as the earth was destroyed by water, so it will be destroyed by fire. And the question is, was it destroyed by water? At least in our idea of what destruction is? No, it was purified. And so the whole idea uh, in the scriptures is reconciliation, purification, cleansing. If we move to the book of Colossians, where Jesus is described uh, cosmically, that's Colossians 1, 15 through 20, uh, we read there that Jesus is the one through whom God made ta panta, means all things. Uh, Jesus is the one who holds ta panta together, everything, that means again. And Jesus is the, is the one by, by whom God reconciles ta panta to himself. So the, the teaching of the scriptures is reconciliation. Uh, it's purification. It's refinement. Uh, when you pray this prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, you're asking for this kingdom to come and this will be, 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 be done. Where? On earth. In heaven? No, it's already been done there. It's on earth, like it is in heaven. And uh, once you just take this little... Once, if you just look at this passage as refiner's language, a whole lot of things slip around. Uh, I still haven't resolved this question for myself. Maybe you can help me resolve it. Uh, you know, there's this description of the time where someone's at the wheel and, and someone will stay and the other one will be taken. I always thought that the good person was going to be taken, right? I mean, that's what we're always taught. There is some reason to think, about, think that way because the saints gather in the air and so on. But it's very interesting to ask what a cleansed earth would look like. Would a cleansed earth be... Uh, all the bad stuff left and the good people removed from it? Or might the new heaven and the new earth have the good people left and the chaff removed? Good question. I, I'm playing with that because, I mean, I'm not, I, I haven't made up my mind on that one yet. But uh, it's very, very exciting to read the scriptures uh, with this kind of expectancy and anticipation of discovery the same kind of anticipation and sense of discovery that I have when I'm studying the desert iguana or a wetland, the scriptures are deep minds. Uh, and they haven't been read very deeply by very many lately. Uh, they have earlier, but right now we're too busy to sit with Genesis 2.15 and sit with it for three hours with no other thoughts in our head except this passage. Uh, we're more likely to say, hey, you know, I got through the whole book of Genesis this month and I'm starting Leviticus tomorrow. Uh, but that's not what the scriptures are. They're a deep mind. And uh, they're rich in uh, the kinds of teaching that we really need uh, at this time. Another question. Maybe someone could shut that door back there. Uh, you mentioned both um, market-based solutions, like it, you suggested for uh, pesticides, and yeah. uh, government regulatory solutions, like the Endangered Species Act. Uh, can you comment on what kind of situations uh, and problems uh, are best solved by both of those approaches? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the question has to do with, you know, when, 
when, when are regulations and when are market strategies the best approaches to use? Um, a, good, a good way to start this is to look at our own bodies um, and, and how they operate and especially how regulation plays a role in our own bodies. There is a famous physiologist who, in the year 1899, a French physiologist by the name of Claude Bernard, uh, made this concluding summary of his research on regulatory physiology. Um, he called the inside of human beings and other organisms the internal environment, our blood, uh, plasma, and so on. And this is what he said. Uh, regulation of the internal environment is the necessary condition for a free life. Now think about that. Regulation of the internal environment is a necessary condition for a free life. The regulation that goes on within our bodies, the regulation of blood sugar, the regulation of body temperature, the regulation of blood pressure, those are things that are giving us the freedom to move, to function without thinking uh, about what these are. Um, and it's, it's critical for us to realize that you cannot generalize the statement that regulation is good or regulation is bad. Uh, regulation al always has to be looked in its context. So. Here's my one way of I, uh, that I have exp uh, expressed this uh, is I have a bumper sticker that says, ban body temperature regulation. Uh, would that be a good idea? Oh, it would be a great idea because then we could decide what our body temperatures will be. And that's exactly what I was doing with my lizards because the lizards do not have the capacity to regulate their own body temperature by raising their metabolism or lowering their metabolism. They cannot do that and so they have to keep moving around in the desert to the right places to get the body temperature they need because they don't generate any of their heat themselves like we do. And so they lose an immense amount of freedom by not having this regulation, this physiological regulation. So, <laughs> so I think politicians should have a course in regulatory physiology. Because in, on the other hand, if, if the regulation puts us in a straitjacket and says, okay, you're not going to move anymore, that's really bad regulation. So our, our key in finding freedom is to find the right kinds of regulation. Now, if we were all free right now to shoot each other, and we all were armed, uh, we would probably feel less free, and we probably would be less free than we are now. And those are the sorts of things that we have to weigh. So uh, that takes care of maybe the regulation part. The market part, uh, the market is a remarkable way to distribute scarce resources. Um, uh, for example, it would be a great way for us to distribute candy bars in this in this uh, in this in this audience. You know, maybe we have 50 candy bars, and uh, and we want to figure out you know how to distribute them. We just might put them all up for sale for $5 a piece or 50 cents a piece and let the market sort this out uh, rather than distributing them uh, uniformly. When we come down to very basic bodily needs like enough to live by, we might not want to use the market at all because it may be that if we did, some of us would just plain die. And, uh, so the market and regulation, I think, all have to be constrained within what we can call stewardship or sustainability. And if the market or regulation knocks us out of that, that's bad. If it keeps, with, keeps us within that, uh, that is good. 
So we can't say, this is my view anyway, we can't say that the market is good. We can't say regulation is good. We can't say it's bad uh, for either of these two either. We have to know the situation under which these operate. And we have to realize too that the environment in the world is always changing so that what, what might have been regulated once might not have to be regulated now. And there may be new things we have to regulate that weren't regulated before. When we had uh, a world, North America, with loads of forests, uh, it would be foolish to regulate the cutting of trees. When you're down to small populations of trees, particular ones in, uh, especially, we might need regulations. And so uh, it is curious to me to have studied the, uh, the uh, development of stop signs as a regulation and find out how people fought that uh, because people were arguing we should not have to stop if no one's coming the other way. And uh, there was the same problem with a center line on the road. We'll just get over when another car is coming. Well, when you get as many cars as we've got and many, as in many intersections as we got, we now do uh, automatically what was fought before. Uh, like we all stop at this <laughs> octagonal red sign that says stop on it. And it's remarkable, even if no one's coming, we stop. And it's total foolishness, isn't it? Uh, it's it's over-regulation. But on the whole, it pays. <laughs> and uh, so if you go through a stop sign, you get a ticket, and you say no one's coming, they won't listen to you. Even though it's very reasonable, that's a case of regulation uh, that we accept. There are some other things we really should regulate, uh, and we, we haven't been able to figure out how to do it. Uh, or there are so many people lobbying against it that we are uh, unable to do it. Wisconsin is a good example in terms of uh, we have no, no bottle bill, no, no can bill. 95% uh, uh, of the people in Wisconsin want a bottle bill, like you know, so many cents per can. But we have the beer industry. And the beer industry has more votes than the people on beer bottles. And uh, you know, dollars vote. That's not right, but that's, that's the way that one works. Other questions, or is this about it? Um, in in uh, concluding here, what, uh, what I'd uh, mentioned to you is this comment by the Mennonite pastor. And there's something else we can say about that, is that some of the best ideas come from people who know from direct experience with the word and with the world. And sometimes some of us who spend too much time in auditoriums and classrooms and speculate about things, sometimes we don't know as much. So it's very important for us to listen to the humble, uh, to listen to the ancient prophets, even to listen to our children, because the truth may be there rather than here. So be alert, be discerning, and know that truth comes in unexpected ways. And uh, know also that God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.